You're all very welcome. Um, it's great to see so many faces here this evening. Um, and obviously we had to move the talk from the gallery space because we'd reached, I think, like 180 people wanted to come to the talk, so we moved into the, the lecture theatre. Um, my name is Jordina Jackson. I'm the director of the Douglas Hyde Gallery. Um, I am really delighted to be joined this evening by exhibiting artists Basama Saba and Jennifer Megan. To my, to my left and left. <laughs> um, hi, Basam. I'm going to do a quick introduction. So Basam al Saba works across digital animation, painting, sculpture, and textiles, creating visions of resistance, transformation, and queer possibility. He completed a BA in visual arts practice from Delary Institute of Art, Design, and Technology in 2016, not so long ago. Um, and recent solo exhibitions include I Am Air, Gasworks in London, and the Delaware Pavilion in Sussex dissolving beyond the War Moon Solstice Art Centre, and it's nice to see Belinda here this evening, and Illusions of Love Died by Sunset at the Lab in 2018. In his current exhibition, It's Dangerous to Go Alone, Take This, Al Saba transforms the gallery into a fantasy dreamscape, embracing the shape-shifting potential of computer-animated worlds with a series of new sculptural works and a new CGI film at its centre. Al Saba builds a world in which selfhood and queer possibility intersect, where multiple intersectional glitches occur within the body, gender, and within internal and external worlds, and ever-present technology. These glitches, or forms of discontent and unraveling, push and challenge preconceived narratives and habitual perceptions of masculinity, taking viewers through a spellbinding journey of metamorphosis and fluidity. The title piece, It's Dangerous to Go Alone, Take This, is an ambitious 30 minute long CGI film featuring ever-changing cinematic sequences from an imaginary video game, which follows the ambiguous hero undergoing numeral, numerous metamorphoses. Combining fantasy, erotica, and body horror, the film unravels and challenges the amped up constructed masculinity that video game avatars embody, as well as the associated idealistic connotations of progress, growth, and transformation. Here, external worlds merge with internal ones, and the body's selfhood untangles from surface and emotions, fluid and technicolor form. And we'll go, we'll, we'll go through this in more depth as part of the talk. <laughs> um, and hello, Jennifer. Hello. <laughs> Jennifer Megan is an artist and researcher, initially trained in graphic design. Her work spans multiple disciplines, and I think it's probably the most expansive. And I think we decided to leave one out <laughs> when we were writing the bio, because it was like, maybe there's too many. So we have merging 3D modeling, sculptures, filmmaking, painting, scent, text, parties, floristry, and flower farming. It's a very robust list. It's impressive. She regularly creates work in collaboration with Basama al Saba and some of you may have seen the works that they've worked on together, and we'll talk a little bit about this as well. And recent exhibitions include Speech Science, uh, curated by Irla McPherson, Visual in Carlo, Crematorium in Two in Transmedial in Berlin, Crematorium at Pia Squared in Belfast, and she's based, well now is based in Limerick, no longer between Belfast, <laughs> Belfast Laws, anyway. Um, Jennifer uses Gallery Two in its multiplicity, bringing forth ideas of fields, graveyards, historical landscape, painting, and fantasy. Nightbloom Chokehold explores flatness, alluding to surveillance, the screen as frame, and persistent image economies. Through the use of arti artificial intelligence, 3D software, and poetry, she has created sculptures of digital paintings that occupy the gallery space and explore the limitations of the digital realm, focusing on how it misunderstands and misrepresents queerness and femininity. Based on ongoing research into women post-famine who rendered themselves invisible and unknowable. Okay. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Just in case there was any question about who the artist were. <laughs> um, Night Bloom Chokehold juxtaposes legible images, fly familiar flying horses and AI-generated family portraits in sculptural form alongside illegible images created by inserting poetry and perfume descriptions into text to image generators. Cross-pollinating ideas of femininity and the economy of contemporary images results in feral and surreal arrangements that lead on erotically charged scenes that illustrate an array of power dynamics. Um, I mean, in some ways, it's funny that that image of the two of you <laughs> came up as part of it. I forgot to mention that it was there before we went into the talk. But I suppose, in many ways, the opportunity of being able to talk to the artist is, is also being able to talk about the kind of process of developing this work. And I think it's, you know, obviously these conversations have been ongoing for kind of two years, a year and a half. 
in terms of the development of the work, but also I suppose what it takes to bring the work into the space and then also what happens within the space. So I think it, it, it's kind of like charting, I suppose, a journey that's occurred that we've all been on as well as the rest of the team at the Douglas Hyde in terms of working to make this happen. So I just, I'm going I'm to kind of begin with the question <laughs> to both of you. Um, and we will have time for questions uh, after an initial series of questions for me. So your practices concurrently both of your practices concurrently mobilize the space of the virtual and the real. Furthermore, the problems inherent in them and the glitches between these spaces underlines all of your work. What fascinates you each about the virtual and what drew you to these spaces in particular? And why is the real and the, and the material and that's very present within the exhibitions important? And what do you see as the relationship between these two spaces? It's, pro it's probably like a big question. <laughs> it kind of delves into everything that you do in your work. Um, who would like to go first? You. Can you hear me OK? Yes. OK, well, thank you all for being here. Um, I was trying to think about how I would answer that question. And I think I was thinking about growing up without the internet, and then the kind of the internet coming into my life. And then all of a sudden, there was this real feeling of like freedom, especially for like someone who was a teenager and all these things that were coming out at the time, like Second Life or like Tumblr and this like influx of all this informa visual information that came with that. And I think the internet in its, <clears throat> in its beginning wasn't as monetized as it is now. So things like Live Journal or Second Life, which I think was like quite important to both our development of like the visuals that we make now. But I think that beginning when I was like a teenager and engaging with the internet in such a level that it wasn't like sanitized it wasn't monitored and people were just kind of putting up stuff for like the fun of it rather than like trying to make a career out of it and i think i've always seen like things being digital or virtual as like a real space of like freedom because even in like cgi software you do have this unlimited freedom in terms of like how big something can be or how shimmery something can be and some part of that like really excites me because I think I'm quite a visual person anyway and I mean I studied painting and print when I was in college but then for a few years when I was in college I worked in a 3D printing center in UCD where I kind of worked with a lot of engineers on like prototyping things and it was such an interesting way of like making something really quickly and being able to see it even though behind the screen you could almost feel like it was tangible and I think it was a very easy way for me to make something that was like in my head and be able to see it and like feel it and I think that's what led me to like really delve into like all the CGI software because I really wanted that feeling of freedom in my work or like I wanted the freedom to make these images that were in my head and I just never found any other thing was capable of like I don't know like containing all of that at once yeah and I think it's like if you're taking photographs or something, you're, you know, like say there's a horse, it's like that horse has like a story or something, yeah, yeah. but you get to generate the, yeah. the kind of origin of the mm -hmm. thing, even if it's, I don't know, is that, yeah. yeah. I mean, a conversation me and Jennifer had when we were making the, the film we made together that Georgina helped us make, which was called A Paradise Out of a Common Field, we kind of kept talking about like, it's nice to have this figure Who's, which was a zombie, and kind of have this figure go through these quite strange scenarios, but you never felt like you were <coughs> abusing anyone or like mm -hmm. forcing a real human being to do something. So you can kind of like tease out all of these like quite intense ideas against like bodies, but then you don't have that same feeling of like putting someone in that position, but you can kind of test that, I almost like a, you can test that idea out without feeling like you're imposing anything on anybody else. Um, yeah, like you can degrade and degrade yeah, yeah, and degrade yeah. and there's no like, oh, I have to be careful with my, yeah, it's yeah. like very object objectifying yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah. And then like the other thing as I've grown older, like all of the CGI software comes with its own like problematic history in that like white skin has been seen as like the pinnacle of like how a CGI program can render. And so like a lot of darker skin tones don't get it's quite hard to render dark skin tones in CGI software because it's not made for that. Yeah, and the stock stuff, like yeah. if you want to render 
like a black person, you have to go for like the, it's like yeah, so only I, tribal people. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, what? So <laughs> like the first couple of um, films that I made that had figures in them, I used like quite a primitive software. To, it was called like Make Human. And I remember there was not a single dark skin tone except for um, tribal skin mm. tone two, mm. which I had to edit out like um, the tribal yeah, like like the blood marks. So, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> so there is like a problematic history to how CGI mm -hmm. has developed. And also, uh, I guess like a lot of the programs that create figures are kind of predominantly used to make like pornographic images. Mm -hmm. So you're also dealing with like that history and that like purpose. And so sometimes it's kind of hard to make a human figure that's realistic, but it can do something that's like hyper masculine or like, like a hyper pornographic female figure, but it can't really get to making like a nuanced figure. Yeah, that's why I stuck with the animals. I was just like, I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> but so when, you, or when we made the film for um, A Paradise at a Common Field, like I made this zombie figure, but you, you do come up against these things where you kind of have to decide how big like this character's chest is, or mm. what, what does this figure, you know, and I had when to... When we go through those, I had to like, like wrap I had it up. to message Jennifer, I'm like, I'm quite uncomfortable making <laughs> these decisions, because yeah. one of the, like, bars was just like, boob sag, and I was like, what, like, I, I'm Which so the appropriate sag. <laughs> <laughs> and Jennifer was just like, 65 percent. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, and then, I don't know, Jennifer, do you want to talk about your, like, I mean, in some ways I think because you, it, the work occupies both of those spaces. Yeah. It almost mines the internet or the virtual, but it also is constantly bringing you back to the connection to the real world, right? The decisions that are made as kind of normative decisions in the development yep. of a particular software or in a kind of image generator that there is like white supremacy as being a kind of something that exists mm -hmm. and has a kind of exists in a, at a higher level of hierarchy than maybe other parts of, of the world somewhat within the virtual. But you also choose to make objects, right? So that, that decision of kind of what the virtual offers as well as what the kind of physical space and being able to create something between those two spaces mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's also kind of just dictated by the gallery itself mm -hmm. because it would be kind of lame to show up and be like, I'm sorry, it's online. <laughs> but like, <laughs> for me, it's more that the computer is just the tool that I use. So they all kind of look like, the, you know, like clay looks like it's made of clay. So I use the computer so it looks like it came from the computer. Mm -hmm. But like if it was the 17th century, I would be making stuff with those like paper cutouts or painting. Um, so that's, for me, it's like there is no real flipping between sort of the virtual or the real. It's just the, yeah, that's what's available to me. And you can press undo and mm -hmm. it's cheap to use. <laughs> like, it's just the, yeah, like, I find the gallery space really sort of dictates that it is an object, but there is still like that relationship with the object or the image becoming the object like a painting feels important still. Mm -hmm. I feel like working with VR and working with completely sort of digital like digital yeah. outputs, uh, just like, it's like uploading to Instagram as a gesture. It's mm -hmm. like not that mm -hmm. fulfilling or something. And then the interactions aren't as fulfilling in the space. Like the space dictates for me the sort of, yeah. So the real is, it's kind of heavily weighted. It's all in the real mm -hmm. and then yeah, the computer's the tool. I feel like I said that like 10 times, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. I think for me, like, I'm quite aware that I use CGI in like, quite a seductive manner. Like, I think the film, there is a seductiveness to CGI, especially in the film where everything is so glossy mm -hmm. and everything is like swaying in such a seductive manner. And it's done on purpose, but I think sometimes there's a trope that happens when artists <coughs> make CGI work where they kind of replicate the CGI world into the gallery space. And I think the reason why I use objects is to kind of create a tension between like the physical space and the space that exists behind the screen, mm -hmm. where I kind of very much wanted the kind of larger sculptures to be quite flat feeling in that like quite matte polystyrene. And so I think I'm quite interested in the tension between 
the kind of physical object versus the kind of the thing that the object that exists behind a screen. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm aware that like my work could be quite seductive, that I think I want to use the kind of physical objects to almost break that seduction, but also create a tension in terms of like how the scale is seen in the film. And I'm like I think the one thing that I was that I really wanted to do with the sculptures that they were all these like disparate body parts, but they all existed at quite different scales. So the arm is on a much bigger scale than the torso and the feet are in a different scale to the arm. And I think that creates quite a, an uneasy feeling when you're looking at the figure and the figure is quite oversized in contrast to the landscape that's in the mm -hmm. film. So there's all of these like, I think it brings your attention to like the decisions that have been made to create the film, like all of these scales and all of these quite specific decisions that you have to make because like when you're rendering flowers and grass and like human hair, they're all simulated separately and there's like all this process of trying to get everything to feel like it's in the same world. Mm -hmm. But then when you start seeing a sculpture, and I think there's something really nice about the Douglas Hyde show where the sculptures kind of, the, their context changes depending on which scene is playing in the film, depending on the sound or depending on what the light is doing. And I think there's something interesting that the sculptures there's like a there's like a, a conversation happening between the sculptures and the film that feels like it's ongoing mm -hmm. while the film is playing. Mm -hmm. I think there's something interesting in that as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your question, <laughs> but yeah, that's so that's yeah. what I'm going with. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, no, I mean I think I was also I remember when we were in trolling, we also had that idea of like placing the fly up on the wall oh, yeah. and kind of the, all of these flies that appear, but they're almost too far away from you to kind of touch. Yeah, yeah. There's something about that idea of something that kind of is hanging around, but you don't want it to yeah, be yeah. there anymore, but you can't quite like, you know, the fly that always goes at least an arm away from where <laughs> you can, you know, move it out of the way. Um, no, that's interesting. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a few questions to Sam and then that's go back right. to Jennifer between <laughs> the three. Um, Bye. <laughs> um, uh, this kind of follows on, Basam. Um, the glitch is a central part of your work, a way to disrupt the normative within game culture and gender norms. Um, preconceived narratives and habitual perceptions of masculinity and the viewer has taken a, a journey of metamorphosis and fluidity. Legacy Russell states, a glitch is an error, a mistake, a failure to function. Within techno culture, a glitch is part of mechanic anxiety, an indicator of something gone wrong. And they can continue, yet these are rather micro examples in the broader scheme of things. If we step back further, considering the larger, more complicated systems that have been used to shape the machine of society and culture, gender is immediately identifiable as a core cog within this wheel. Gender has been used as a weapon against its own populace. Uh, they continue, when we gender a body, we are making assumptions about the body's function, its socio-political condition, its, flu its, fi its fix it, fix it, fixity. Oh my God, that's a difficult word. Um, when the body is determined as a male or female individual, the body performs gender as its score, guided by a set of rules and requirements that validate and verify the humanity of that individual, a body that pushes back at the application of pronouns or remains indecipherable within binary assignment is a body that refuses to perform the score. Mm. This non-performance is a glitch. This glitch is a form of refusal. And Juliana Huxtable, I suppose, thinking about this idea of like the virtual, the real, as well as the glitch that's occurring within the, the image making, but also in this kind of representation making that's occurring. Juliana Huxtable, um, kind of talked about the idea that um, and along with many other artists that the online space is a space is a site to represent and reperform the gender identities the internet represents a tool for global feminist organizing and an opportunity to be a pro protagonist in one's own revolution it's also a safe space a way not just to survive but also resist repressive sex gender regimes and the antagonistic normativity of the mainstream um, the glitch is something that's appeared in your work for quite a period of time, but I think in many ways with, with the more recent film, it, it's much more evident. And actually it's, it's been kind of exaggerated mm -hmm. in many ways, not only in terms of the glitch of something appearing like it's not necessarily working, and there, there's also a longer history of your, your kind of interest in the archeology span of mm -hmm. media in many ways as well. Um, 
I suppose, what's the importance of the glitch or what, what interests you in that glitch in terms of, and then also this idea of like, what is that relationship mm. to gender? Because I know that's another part of the development of this work. I guess there's like a few things. One is, goes back to this idea of like CGI being quite seductive. And like, and I am like, I mean, one of the things is like, I do enjoy being seduced by an artwork. So I'm not like afraid of something being seductive, but I also enjoy when that like seduction breaks down and you see the strings behind everything. And I think one of the things that I'm aware of is that like, because I make the films, like, I mean, I am actively doing the CGI work and the animation that I'm aware of what happens in the program, that I'm aware that all of these figures are actually hollow or like they the hair is actually made up of just two strands of hair that's multiplied mm -hmm. 50,000 times. And I find those things really interesting because you can almost see how all, it all functions. Mm -hmm. And I think in a little bit in the film is like, as my CGI skills are getting better, I'm kind of pushing against the program a bit. Like there is things that the program just doesn't want to do with these like meshes, which is like all of the 3D models are just like made up of triangles throughout the film. But then I, I'm really interested at the moments where like there's like a peak in how seductive something is and I'm in a moment that all kind of breaks away and you're kind of aware of how hollow the whole setup is. Mm -hmm. Like actually the figure is hollow and it like intersects into the landscape or like the flowers are swaying and they're really beautiful but in, in a shot or two the, the flowers are like intersecting each other and you're aware that there is this like fabrication happening in front of your eyes that what you're looking at isn't real. Because I think there's something about the film that like, I think when you first start watching it, it may seem a bit jarring that like the figure has this like quite glossy skin and like the flowers are swaying quite exaggerated. But then as the film like progresses and you're watching it, I think you become quite comfortable with the world that's being built. But I think I don't want it to be just like pure seduction that every now and again I do like when that illusion like breaks down and I think that in a way like ties in with the thing about gender in that I mean I don't know at what point I was I kind of decided that this is what the figure will look like and I think it was a point where I was like well in order to start anim and it was this was like before I made the film for Gasworks which also included the same figure and I was like, well, in order for me to start making this work, I just kind of have to make a figure. And I kind of went through a couple of months where I was, first I was going to make this quite realistic looking figure, but then it kind of looked a bit comical because the program just couldn't make a realistic looking figure. Like I tried to give him a bit of a belly and then that didn't work. Or like tried to make him like just not so, like, ski like not, ski not, not skinny, but just so not like so perfect. Because mm -hmm. I think there's something about CGI that it's quite hard to make something look not perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a point where I kind of decided that the figure will be just kind of this kind of basic male figure. But then like throughout the film, I think there's quite a discomfort when the figure becomes hyper-masculine. And I think the only time the figure feels comfortable is towards the end of the film when he's like growing flowers out of his body. So I guess I'm interested in this idea of gender through like a fantasy or like a sci-fi lens mm -hmm. about like not even like outside of like a non-binary but just mm -hmm. even like outside of, outside of like a human idea of gender mm -hmm. like I don't know I feel like we've had this conversation quite often in that I feel like I've experienced the world in a very feminine way but I also am aware that like I, I think I look quite masculine mm -hmm. I don't think my bone structure uh, would ever look androgynous mm -hmm. under any mm -hmm. circumstances mm -hmm. but then I think it's almost trying to translate that in like a visual way about like a discomfort between what's going on internally versus the kind of the truth in that I am mm -hmm. like a male figure mm -hmm. also in this world. And is that something, I suppose, particularly with this film, the notion of selfhood or that idea of the emotional actually, yeah. because say in comparison to I Am Error where the character goes through these different kind of journeys in this work, there's much more kind of internal world becomes much more visible and maybe some kind of a struggle that exists as yeah. part of that. And I suppose the, the, uh, that, that idea of the, the what is on the surface and what is internal yeah. kind of manifests throughout the film, that was a very conscious decision. Yeah, and I think I kind of, like I wanted this film to feel quite different from the previous film. And I, in the previous film, I really tried to make the world feel real. Like there was like weight to the figures and the figures 
the, the, the kind of protagonist meets a lot of figures and they're interacting with each other. But I think with this film, I really wanted to kind of have this feeling of almost like weightlessness mm -hmm. or like hollowness that the figure is always orbiting this like idea of just like nothingness. And then in that nothingness, there's just this like huge amount of like internal or like emotional or something that's just almost like non bodily. Mm -hmm. But then to also exaggerate the body, like that the, this, this like the scene of the crying, mm -hmm. it just kind of started off as a quite a like a small scene, but then over time it just kept exaggerating it to the, to the point where like the end of the scene is the tears like consuming mm -hmm. the body, mm -hmm. and then it's I think part of the film is also about that like interaction, what like the internal versus the external, and how you're viewed from the outside versus what you feel on the inside. I think that's that's what I'm gonna go with. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> um, and I mean, maybe that kind of continues on that idea of silence, right? I think we talked about that. That in comparison to a number of the previous films, where you would often use the kind of tropes of game culture and yeah. have like speech bubbles, there's very little text within this. Obviously, there's no voice, but then one of the things that gets repeated is this head heart repeat. And yeah, maybe the resonance of, of yeah. that particular statement and just that, that decision to kind of maybe emphasize what's internal and undisclosed. I think like the silence of the protagonist kind of came from like reading quite a lot about like how Nintendo made um, Link from The Legend of Zelda as mm -hmm. this like silent protagonist so that the, the player can kind of impose their identity onto the character mm -hmm. so that the character isn't saying something that you wouldn't say but actually they're just kind of interacting with this world through silence but also I think that like my favorite games to play are the ones that like lead you through the narrative of the game just purely on a visual note so there's like a few games that do that whether it's like Super Metroid or like uh, like a few of the early Zeldas but I think there's something interesting where like you have these like visual cues that kind of lead you through something and you're not leading something leading someone through the narrative of the film and you're not telling them what to think mm -hmm. and I think that was quite important for me that someone can just come in and have a completely different experience to the experience I had making it um, what was the other part of the question um, I suppose that head heart repeat oh, yeah. that idea that, that like the, specific text I think that's the head repeated. heart repeat I kind of wanted oh, no, it to it's, <laughs> it's cold up here in case, anyone, in case you're wondering what's going on it's like actually very chilly <laughs> for no real reason um, anyway. the head heart repeat I almost wanted it to be like a like when you die in a video game and it asks you if you will continue and you, and if, if you're up against a really hard level you kind of see the continue sign yeah. over and over again so I kind of wanted there to be like one piece of text that gets repeated so it almost feels like the character is going through something again or like trying again. Mm -hmm. And even this idea of like the start of the film, this, the character almost appears as like he's in a loading screen mm -hmm. and then it ends on a continue. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something about like the repetition of something uh, almost being a little bit, not aggravating, but just like s feeling the same thing twice or like wanting to do it again mm -hmm. but better. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but kind of just felt right. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so many, so much of like, the work I make, I kind of make it on intuition, and then you try and understand what that intuition was afterwards. I, I found that as a better way of working for me. Mm -hmm. There's something, there's some parts of the work that I haven't figured out for myself, but I think, I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Um. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> no questions. Um. Uh, so it's like sculpture has been a big part of your practice from the enlarged computer game figures, iridescent that were part of, and propped up in the gallery space that were in the lab, the gr 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 grandizer, grandizer um, to the large scale styrofoam CNC cut works, the head, the torso, the duck hide, their scale in opposition to the kind of 3D printed iridescent flies and the hands and the flowers that are dispersed throughout the gallery. What draws you to the sculptures? And I think in I Am, in I Am Eric, Gasworks and Delawar, there was also the film installation yeah. as well as, and the very large film installation, I suppose the one at the Douglas Hyde is like five meters wide. Delawar was probably a somewhat similar scale. Yeah. Um, 
what draws you to the sculptures and that they're always presented with the, the film work? I think that there's something nice about extending the film into the gallery mm -hmm. space. And I also think that I kind of made the work all at once. So every now and again, there'll be an idea that I'll make into a scene, but then it doesn't work. And then I'll rethink it for like a sculpture. And I guess so much of it is kind of thinking about the kind of tension between what you want to bring in into, as like a physical object versus like the film that's being created. And also there's something really interesting that like I've like sculpted all of the sculptures, mm -hmm. like I have made them, but there's something kind of nice about their feeling so completely like devoid of human touch that they're these like perfectly formed mm -hmm. figures that kind of appear out of a machine. Mm -hmm. And I'm also really interested because I did work in a 3D printing center, so I think I'm also interested in like that I make a lot of 3D models, but then there is kind of a point where it's so nice to kind of actually touch it, mm -hmm. to actually see mm -hmm. it in real life. Mm -hmm. And I think some, like, um, I didn't actually see any of the sculptures until we kind of started install mm -hmm. and they came in and they were much bigger than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember the torso came in and his nipples had like popped through the <laughs> bubble wrap and I was like, oh God, <laughs> this is gonna be ridiculous. <laughs> um, but I think there's something kind of, <laughs> That was not time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's something really fun about bringing the digital into the real life and kind of almost seeing the kind of failures mm -hmm. of the sculpture. So like the, say the polystyrene is so delicate mm -hmm. that actually like over time, a few of the sculptures from I Am Error and from the Gasbrook show in Del Delaware had actually, they're kind of worn down a bit. And I think there's something nice about the kind of failures of like bringing the virtual into the real mm -hmm. world. And even sometimes like the 3D prints will kind of collapse on themselves. Some of them are broken and they're kind of exhibited broken. Mm -hmm. Cause I, and I kind of, I'm aware that I also push the 3D printing to its limit that every time I put in an order, they kind of send me an email and they're like, if anything breaks, it's on you. <laughs> and I'm like, I understand. But then they're like, they're very happy, I think, when I put in order, because they usually work on a lot of like engineering stuff. Okay. That it's a lot of like squares and straight lines. That, okay. And I think. <laughs> then they're like, surprise, yeah, yeah. it's a torso. Um, <laughs> but I do push it to the limit, as in like, they won't allow you to print anything that's under two millimeters. Okay. And everything that I've 3D printed is only two millimeters okay. thick. So there's something nice about like, pushing the machines to their limit of like representation of like mm -hmm. how far can you go with like representing something so detailed and then the inherent like failure of the mm -hmm. machine at like representing that. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I suppose maybe to turn, turn to you, Jennifer. <laughs> um, maybe, see I don't know that it's necessarily an opposition, but I think in some ways the way, there's a certain emphasis of flatness, right? As opposed to the kind of exaggerated sculptural bodily parts that occur with Bassam's work. And also with the installation that that was a real emphasis from different angles where you encounter these really exaggerated gestures. We could maybe talk about that a little bit later as well. Like particularly the arm or the torso kind of like in some kind of exaltation pose. Um, with your work, while you have taken a kind of a, the reference of Pegasus from Paris Court Gardens, it's become very flat. And in some ways, you've taken a 3D image or a 3D reference and kind of exaggerated the flatness of it. And that the gallery space becomes something whereby you're constantly kind of encountering the flatness almost of work. And I suppose maybe that, that interest in flatness or the, the kind of possibilities of flatness within your work. Yeah, I guess it's like, yeah, just kind of the opposite. <laughs> like, I really like the geometry and sort of thinking about the X and the Y and the Z axis, uh, axis in Cinema 4D. Um, and then, like, the Photoshop sort of layer system and kind of letting the software almost sort of do that. Like, it kind of has the physicality that's kind of enough for me. And then, um, so then the, for me, like a system, I like to have a system when I work that's like kind of like an Ikea system. So mm -hmm. I'm like, assembly will be simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, it will be flat and it will be against the wall and it will be a screen or a cutout mm -hmm. or, and um, it's just like the way I organize 
sort of the chaos of the files because I don't want chaos in every part of the work. Um, so when I'm, I'm trying to push the limits, I guess more yeah. in the software and then for you, maybe it's in the output, yeah. I don't know. Um, and I think for me, 2D just seems like enough because like even when you think of like, um, what's her name? She's a mathematician, she was from Cork. Like Alicia, Alicia Boole, I think mm -hmm. she was like, a, I don't know when she was alive, the 1900s-ish. Um, and she was all about like sort of pushing, visualizing for the fourth dimension. But her drawings could only ever be 2D. So it was like, how do you visualize? I don't know, I like that sort of tension between if it's sculpture, it's still 2D. So mm -hmm. I have to work with maybe scale to make mm -hmm. it feel like it's from a different dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. So the flatness there, yeah, it's literally just like a byproduct of simplifying the method of getting mm -hmm. it in the world. Mm -hmm. um, I, also, I also think your interest in the default yeah. kind of plays yeah. with the interest in the flatness. Yeah, like a screen, like you're mostly viewing stuff on screens anyway, so why? There's almost no need to take it further because yeah. the viewing platform for most of my work anyway is a screen, yeah. I guess. And like just taking, like I'm engaging with it as a 2D object on a, a screen just by the nature of the screen. So and it looks like the software that it was made in, like either like an AI thing looks like it's made with a machine or Photoshop documents always look like they're made in Photoshop. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's like when, like minimalism, I guess. Kind of, I don't know, it's like just letting a thing be a, f I, is that minimalism? I actually don't know. <laughs> I don't think anybody would describe your work as minimalism. I feel like it's really <laughs> I've never felt so minimal. <laughs> And then the flowers. <laughs> <and then laughs> throw stuff in this place. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I guess then not having, choosing to work with like found objects then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a default, again, it's I just like letting the things be what they are. Yeah, and I also think there's something interesting about when you bring, do bring in like a 3D model into like Cinema 4D, which is the program we both use, you are looking at an object behind mm -hmm. the screen. And I think there's something interesting about Jennifer's work in that like the sculptures and the paintings and the videos are all made on the same software that they're just presented differently, yet they're all flat. It's mm -hmm. so like the painting is flat. But it's also like 1600 yeah. layers, like, yeah, yeah. like pushed so there, together. There is this kind of return to like flatness that I think relates more so to painting. This like... Yeah, and I think then paintings represent a rep, uh, relationship with the land. Like when I think of a paint, I kind of interchange them all in the system where I'm like, oh, it could be like, that's when you go through the list of like the flower farming mm -hmm. and like they're all, to me, it's like a default, which is like yeah. a, rect a rectangle. So that I'm thinking about like the layers to the land and the soil and the thing, the thing that's on the surface is kind of just one component of it. And then there's loads of, it kind of like expands the image and then contracts it all in the same, the, I guess the printing is the contracting, but mm -hmm. the software is like expanding the image or something. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know us. You know Apparently. <laughs> um, and I suppose, it, I mean, it, it was interesting working on the exhibition with both of you because in some ways there was long conversations yeah. with the Passam about ma masculinity and then with Jennifer there was long conversations about femininity and yeah. we were talking about like... Performing gender. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily performing gender, I would say. But, um, but then you talked about, I mean, one, you have this long-standing interest in this kind of women-only communities that developed during the famine like after, in Ireland. After the famine. After the famine. Um, and a kind of self-determination that seemed to occur within that space, as well as then I'm re talking about trying to find a kind of, like an AI image of a lesbian relationship and that the, the system, the program that you were using, see, I'm using like system when I should be saying <laughs> program, but anyway, um, the program that you were using kept on generating this mother-daughter image. And that's something that you can see within the, the um, locket piece that's in gallery two. Um, I suppose that idea of like representing or misrepresenting or thinking about what the kind of parameters of mm. femininity exist is a kind of longstanding interest. What, what kind of draws you to those questions? Yeah, I think it's tied to the default again. And like, um and then the communities were kind of a way of looking at people who were choosing to access other ways of living outside of those uh, systems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, like the AI thing was, it was, I was using, I think the only ones I use are the publicly available. So it's like Dali, 
Starry AI, uh, Night Cafe, um, kind of the ones that everyone was using and putting their pictures in and getting portraits back or whatever. Um, yeah, and I kept just putting in like women, embracing women, or just like, it eventually got just really weird because I had to literally, you can't say like PVC or latex because that's porn. So you have to put like black shiny garments. <laughs> and you kind of learn like, oh, is this how like, hashtags or like, is this like, you kind of learn how maybe the machines are reading things and misreading. Um, so every time I put in like two women, like, cause when I started, I was like, I really want to make a painting that's like two horses on the side of a highway next to two women wrestling. And I was like, let's see if it could do it. And it was like, no, that's porn. Women wrestling is porn. And I was like, that's like an industry. <laughs> like, and then everything was like lesbian porn. Like, yeah, gimp, well, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Like, some of it was like, okay. But again, it's like, <laughs> like shocker. <laughs> and also like, like you can wear it, like, I don't know. It's like the policing of things that are now fashion as well. Mm -hmm. that, so there's that line between like, yeah, I don't know, like Kim and Kanye have done the mask thing and that's fine, but apparently it's porn in yeah. whoever, it's who like determining sort of the demographic of the people who are programming the sort of software. It was like a fun way to play with that. Um, so yeah, I just kept getting loads of pictures of uh, older women embracing younger, <laughs> like little girls. And I was like, I, in a joking kind of way, it kind of is representative of some relationships I might have had <laughs> in my past. And then on the other hand, I was like, eh, no. <laughs> um, and then the other, what was the other part of the question? The communities. Community. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess like uh, part of that comes from, I'm gonna go on a really like, a biography. <laughs> no, I grew up in um, Singapore, but my family's from West Cork. Um, so I remember obviously in Singapore, it's like a benevolent dictatorship. There's very strict rules um, and everyone kind of adheres to the sort of social structures that are put in place because you get like a, d a good quality of life out of it for the most part. Um, that's a, a wide, wide generalization of a whole country. But I remember when I was a kid going to, when you would go drive out to the zoo, there was a huge bit of rainforest um, right next to um, a, like a field of satellite dishes that were communicating. I think it was for the internet or something. And there was a group of people who lived in the forest who kind of rejected um, the econ economy mm -hmm. and the sort of standards where every building had to have like 5% Malay or 10% Hindu or whatever you identified as to keep the society moving fluidly. So they would just like sell cigarettes illegally and kind of live off the grid. Um, and then I went to North Carolina and learned about, um, I was just there for my brother's wedding. And went to Great Dismal Swamp where I also learned about um, sort of the, a, a stop on the Underground Railroad where people would escape slavery and live with sort of, there'd been a history of uh, Native Americans living there to kind of avoid being found. And then the same thing was happening. And so it was again, like this, this kind of trend where I was just interested in people who were just choosing to live off the grid, but not in a way that like the YouTube algorithm promotes of like, like build your own house. Yeah. And it's always like a white guy with a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, yeah, and then I was like, oh, I'll just look in Ireland and see who I can identify and actually found quite a lot of um, particularly groups of women who just chose to sort of ignore what was being dictated, these very sort of narrow set of parameters that women had to kind of adhere to in the 1860s and on. Um, and some of them were still groups that were going and were still alive, so I was able to email them like their forward-facing representative because they're top secret and you're basically never allowed to know them. And I kind of got this, I was like, because of abstraction in my work and the role of that, and that kind of barrier with like not really letting someone mm -hmm. know, like, yeah, like just keeping things kind of secret. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, I could kind of relate to that. And I wanted to, yeah, use the sort of the paintings in the show to kind of be like, oh yeah, I'm talking about bodies, but not of, I don't know. It was like the first time I put a, a human in a show, I think mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. maybe the second. So it was all like coming together, but I'm still not sure I could explain what the show actually does or is. <laughs> that, <Yeah>. is <laughs> that was that a is long okay. winded answer, <laughs> sorry. But there was also, um, what's the name of that goddess cult? The ones that made the video game? 
think you talked with their leader. Yeah, yeah that's one. Yeah, Silver, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was Silver the Sisterhood in yeah, Donegal. Yeah. yeah, they're super interesting. Yeah, right? they're like a Victorian LARPing uh, lesbian femdom cult. <laughs> I guess that's probably an oversimplification. <laughs> <laughs> they made a lot of, like, not a lot. They made a few games, um, okay. like uh, role-playing games. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there's, they still exist now, yeah. but no one knows who or where yeah. they are. Yeah. They took over the house in Donegal that the primal screamers were in, if you know that. Cult. I don't know if they're cults. <laughs> <laughs> what is a cult? <laughs> we could get it. I feel like there's many different yeah. <laughs> journeys that we can go down at this point. Um, I'm going to maybe ask one more question and then open it up. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to open it up to um, every, everybody here. Um, but I... I suppose I'm interested in, well, like one, it's very, it's very evident sitting here with you and any time that I spent in your company, it's that you're very close friends, but also that you have collaborated quite a lot on a number of different film works, as well as like having this ongoing conversation and the Artist Eye series invites the artist who's exhibiting in Gallery 1 to invite an artist of kind of influence or importance into presenting Gallery 2. Um, how did you first come to kind of collaborate? If that's a if that's a story that could be told, <laughs> in. Yeah. And I then, needed help. And, <laughs> and then I suppose, what do you each gain? I'm conscious that many people here in the audience might also be artists. Like, what do you gain from the collaboration? Because it's not necessarily that you've collaborated once and then that was it. It's like you have you have your own independent practices, but then at times you come together and work together. Um, so just to maybe talk a little bit about that. I think we just I think we met through someone and then found out we just used the exact same set of software, but then ended up with such wildly different results. Yeah, and I kind of gave up using the software. <laughs> and I kept like, I couldn't pirate the right one. And <laughs> I'd come to you and I'd be like, um, can you send? Like, it was just like a lot of, like, oh, I need to do this. Like, how do you do that again? <laughs> and then you'd be like, will I just make it? Or will we just do it together? And then it was like a, just like a, I think it just kind of just became a conversation that yeah. kept going. Like, yeah. And I think so much of there's so much of the conversations we both have with each other in our individual. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not I don't want to speak for you, but I think there's so mm -hmm. much of the conversations that I have with Jennifer that kind of makes its way into the work, whether we're talking about like what does it mean to have a CGI figure and then impose like a gender on it, even though they're kind of genderless in the program. Mm -hmm. And like one of the things we talked about is that if you are to give genitals to the figure, they are inevitably going to be porn genitals. Mm -hmm. And so there is like all of these questions that happen in the background that it's kind of nice to have like a conversation with someone who is also engaged with those things. And then I think every few months we'll kind of check in and we'll just be thinking about the same things like inevitably. Like I remember when we were making the film for RTE, I just like called Jennifer and I was like, I'm really thinking a lot about zombies. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer was like, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> and we were like, right. And then we made another film, but it was like much shorter and it had like a much smaller budget. And we had one meeting and I remember Jennifer being like, I'm thinking about eyeballs. And I was like, right, yeah, I got it. Was, like, I'm done. Like That's all we need. Google Meet thing and then yeah, yeah. just put it together. Um, but I think there's like, like a lot of unspoken sort yeah. of understanding that I don't know how you talk about. <laughs> but it's just like, yeah, like, and we, we're pretty good at, like, for me, my experience of collaborating or working with collectives and stuff is very, like, we must have a meeting and then you organize it and then you've had so many bad times that you're actually not sure why you're still doing it. So we just don't do any of that yeah. and just, like, wing it and hope for the best. I think we kind of... But it is structured. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. don't know. But I think yeah. we also, I mean, I, we both work alone for mm. quite a lot of the time that I think it's nice to, every now and again, make something collaboratively to take you out of your internal conversation and actually have to communicate with someone. And then it's also nice to not feel the weight of the work is just on you, mm -hmm. yeah. that you can make work with someone. And it's and we're more playful, I think, yeah, when we make stuff yeah. together than in our, like, but it also is going to be very serious. Yeah. <laughs> but like the process is playful. But I think like after the last couple of years, and we were just talking about this before the talk started, like I kind of, don't have another like solo year in me. Like I kind of want to make work with someone. And so, mm. I mean, like we're gonna work on something over the next year yeah. that kind of overlaps so many of the things that are in this, in both these exhibitions that mm -hmm. kind of are coming together, whether it's like the idea of the garden and the idea of like femininity or like, yeah. I don't 
Okay. Yeah, no, and I think we kind of tease the opposite things out of each other. Like, I don't yeah. like working with, hu I didn't like working with the human body. And then when we worked together, I was like, oh, actually, it's just like another sort of material. Yeah. And you were very sort of, sort of human robot yeah, yeah. cyborg based. And then the animals kind of yeah, crept yeah. in. So I think there's like a, <laughs> <laughs> like, but there was just like a. <laughs> Watch What's this so face? funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just talking. <laughs> Oh yeah, but okay. Good, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Uh, are there any, any questions from the audience? Oh, yeah. okay with that. Okay, take... We'll have to share a mic, Jennifer. You hold it. You'll probably. <laughs> there is. Oh yeah. To be like Owen. It's so cold. Oh. Do oh. I think we need. I think we need one here. Oh, you do it. Yeah, I think we need. Yeah, push out. This is actually just for the more just like a process question for the styrofoam pieces. You said they only just arrived in. Were they supposed to be by like a separate company, or was it printing or what? Yeah, there's a there's a a company in Limerick called Odyssey Studios, and they do a lot of like. Um, special effects on film and make a lot of props, but they have like a five point CNC machine. And I kind of contacted them like quite early, like a few years ago. And I just kind of wanted to tease, I was like, would you be able to make these things? And I knew they were, they're not easy to make. Like these, like the arm, no, sorry, the wing was the most expensive mm -hmm. work, not because it was the biggest or it used the most amount of material, but it was like, it actually had to be made in about 12 pieces because of the way the wing was like bent. Mm -hmm. But I kind of really, I'm interested in like pushing these machines to a limit to not make it easy on the machine to actually push it to a point where you're like, this is as far as this machine can go. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also nice when you get it and then you all of a sudden have this object that you've only looked at at this scale and you get this thing that's like really big and there's something kind of magical that happens. And I think it also kind of disrupts the scale that's in the film. Um, but yeah, so they have like a five point machine that kind of mills into a block of polystyrene. Um. <laughs> I think there was a question here in the middle. Is that right? I, uh, um, I was uh, very taken with that talking about your relationship, you know, your, the, the work relationship, and obviously the, the friendship as well. Um, I don't even know if this is really a question, but more kind of about, you know, something that, you know, felt. Um, like, looking at the Sam's work, like, I was so seduced by the, the video work, like, just going to, I don't know about it, it was like, a, like, falling in love. Um, but what I was really drawn to about Jennifer's work, it's funny, <coughs> The striking imagery within the 2D, you talked about the 2D. But I found your work to be very sculptural, uh, the way you do that, placed it in, 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 in the space, they're almost um, kind of cropped, or almost kind of sneaking out of the room. They're not quite kind of sitting there, uh, happy, being a little off it, uh, hanging on the edge. I just, I just was very drawn to the kind of was a secrecy to that. Or, and, uh, and I found it very intriguing as well. It's all slightly not totally comfortable in the space of the even the way you prop the canvases, they almost look like they fall over. Yeah. Or, or your the way you place your the horse, his backside, you know, such a weird angle in the corner. <laughs> 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 What's that about? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. No, it was more like, um, I was kind of playing off the sort of the mother-daughter special thing of the locket with the, the two horses with scale. Um, and then I just didn't want two horse heads in the show because in such a small space. So I kind of made it feel like it was almost like the, it was like being generated or kind of loading out of the wall or something. It was kind of what it, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's interesting. It's actually kind of a read that I want to escape the gallery. All the work's just like ready to go. <laughs> Pack it up. Yeah, yeah that's, that's an interesting, thank you for that. <laughs> Are there? Um, just because you were talking earlier about um, 
know, when you're making figures in your work about like hyper masculinity or like hyper femininity, um, I guess just kind of during the process, is there a part where um, it feels like it's starting to drift into objectifying or fetishy almost, if that makes any sense? Um, and just kind of uh, like, I guess, at what point do you think it's like, um, okay, you know, this is this is too hyper either which way, and that's a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know if that made any <laughs> sense. I guess for me, I'm kind of interested in teasing out intensities in the work so it's kind of inevitable that I'm going to go into these kind of like hyper masculine or hyper feminine but I think I I think that's also like when I'm looking at like the visual material that the work kind of stems out of or in video games whether it's like billboards there is that kind of pushing things to the limit whether it's the figures in the video games that are so hyper masculine or the figures in the same video game of like feminine bodies are so hyper feminine that like sometimes I'll play like a Final Fantasy game and the female figure, like the male figure will be so hyper armored, but then the female figure will just have these like teeny tiny chains and you'll be like, this She's isn't dead. the same world. Like, you know, if we're in this, like just, but I think that video games play on those intensities and in a way I kind of wanted to bring those intensities into these works. Mm -hmm. But I guess the last couple of works have dealt with that. So in a way, for me, it was kind of natural to kind of deal with these kind of like quite polar opposite intensities. I don't know for you. I think it was that for you. Oh, <laughs> I don't know, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? <laughs> In the back. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested, Bassan, in like your use of the glitch and also a queer artist, so like I find a lot of sense of meaning behind the glitch. Um, I've been reading on glitch feminism, I don't know if you've heard of it, but I was just wondering if you have any other references uh, that you think would be useful for someone starting to look into that stuff? Um, my mind is going a bit blank. <laughs> <laughs> That's <what> um, <laughs> I don't know. I think there are other references. I actually just can't think right now. Um, I'm very I, sorry, I but I, I will. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> Jennifer is like, I have all the I think it's your thing. She's doing a PhD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Rosa, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce these names correctly. Rosa Menkman, I think, has quite a lot of writing, if you don't already know her. And um, I think a collection, a collective, not a collective, like a group of. Uh, sort of digital post-internet artists did a, I think it's called The Impossible Reader or something. It was only published a few, like maybe a week ago. It's like Lorna Mills and a few other um, sort of professors who have like, I think it's like a collection of texts that talks, like touches on the glitch stuff quite a lot. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And um, if we get your email, I have a couple of resources myself when I was doing research for the exhibition, so we can set up. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Really do what the work for me. If there are. Okay, I have one more question over there. Who, who was first? Or is it just you? <laughs> yeah, we, we go with you now. Do you want to go first? I'm going to think Catharsis. <laughs> I'm going to have to think of the definition of the word catharsis for a minute. Mm. I think this is the first film I've made that has ended on a somewhat of a happy note for me. Like usually the films I always tend to end them with everyone like disappearing or like disintegrating. Where I think this one felt quite joyous of like the figure returning to space almost. And I kind of, I think I'm at a point now where I don't want to end things on a kind of sad note. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I think like as I'm growing older, I kind of think that with the, f I mean. <laughs> I mean, older. I'm as old as I've ever been. So like, you guys. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I think 
I, when I was younger, we, like even like the film uh, from the lab, which was like a recreation of our old home in Iraq. And then my grandmother speaks in the end. I just remember everyone in that opening like crying. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that too intense. And I think there was a point where I was like, I am making these point like heavy, like yep. almost like sad works. And I think there was a point where I was like, you can still kind of deal with those intensities, but you can also, I think it's important to show kind of like a joy, even through this kind of like sprouting. And I think one of the things that like both me and Jennifer always return to, return to is this idea of like a garden or this idea of like a plant mm -hmm. and I think there's something about like regeneration mm. in the work that I think is a bit cathartic that there's this idea of like decomposition or things kind of falling apart but there's it always kind of goes back to this idea of something growing out of that decomposition yeah I think it's kind of the garden thing for yeah. me too it's more like the gallery sort of moment is like summer <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's like you put it like the burst of energy, and then the sort of oh, this is very cheesy, <laughs> like, and then it blooms. <laughs> <laughs> but and then there's like the whole process after. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like for me giving them an object, like yeah, it's it's not it's kind of like the end of their life, but also yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's just giving them yeah. life, not like it's kind of like why you even. I've use actually, the software in yeah. the first place to create this thing that didn't exist, but like neither of us like want children, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, all right, yeah. I think I've grown quite it. empathetic towards the figure in the film that I kind of don't want him to have a bad ending. I don't know, after yeah. a while I've become quite like fond of these figures that we end mm. up making. Yeah, I really feel yeah, like, yeah. like with the horse too, I feel like like my children are, <laughs> I'm like, I have a sad emotional attachment to that horse in the room, the big one. Like, what if, what if it was real? What if it was real? <laughs> If we come in tomorrow and there's like hay yeah. in front of the horse, it'd be like ten. <laughs> um, there was one question somewhere in there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, we might, we might just uh, leave it on the very hopeful <laughs> note about the garden note. <laughs> and emotional attachment. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer thank and Basam.